Sarab Amari is one of the founders and editors of Compact, a radical American journal. His book on the tyranny of the private sector will be out next year, and he had a, an excellent op-ed in the New York Times. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, you wrote in the New York Times that the Republican Party's fake populism and lack of attention to the working class played a key role in thwarting a red wave. Uh, elaborate on your theory. Sure. I mean, I should make clear that I'm, you know, I'm of the right. Um, but over the past uh, five, six years, I, you know, initially saw promise in uh, the direction the pop party was taking in terms of uh, of populism, and there were some achievements, right? I mean, um, the tariffs that the Trump administration championed stuck, and the Biden administration has not altered uh, any of them. But since then. Um, you know, the Trump administration got consumed in a lot of its own scandals, whether they were real and some of them were media concocted. Um, and a lot of the personnel it appointed were, um, you know, despite his rhetoric, his pro-worker rhetoric, were typical Republican Chamber of Commerce personnel. And so as it cashed out in terms of, for example, uh, labor union policy, his Department of Labor was unfortunately profoundly hostile to, to unionism. Um and, but more recently, I mean, if if Trump was sort of halting and self contradictory as a as a pro worker quote unquote populist, what I worry the past two years since he left office is the Republicans um, championing this kind of language of the multiracial working class, which is this mantra a lot of uh, Republican lawmakers and operatives repeat um, over and over, uh, uh, and talking about themselves as a working class party is merely kind of at the level of culture war and what they're doing at the level of policy is actually reconsolidating back to the kind of Reagan era consensus of the right, which was, you know, anti-union deregulatory um, against kind of raising up workers, countervailing power in the workplace. Um, and it's, it's all just culture, right? So they talk about like XYZ corporation fired an employee for having the wrong views, which by the way, might be bad that the, 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 the company did that, but they won't then go to, well, how do we prevent that? Well, you know, there's this thing called the labor union that can, uh, impose due process requirements or, uh, uh, termination for cause requirements on, on a workplace. They won't go there. So I've become a lot more cynical as I've watched this develop and recognize that it's all just kind of rhetorical and culture war, it doesn't actually get at the material issues in our political economy. And do you think it impacted the the outcome of the election, though? Like this message was if people were going, you know what, I don't see any improvement in my life in terms of uh, as a worker. And the Republican Party is offering us a culture war. They're offering us a, you know about woke, but um, what about minimum wage and so forth? What about uh, what about workers uh, being overworked and so forth? So you think that had an impact? Talk about you know how you think that played into the election. It's early days yet in terms of analyzing the results. So I will fully say that this is somewhat kind of educated speculation, right? But we did see uh, you know um, still as has been happening over the past six since the Trump era, you saw the Republican Party continue to it does manage to coax. Um, workers uh, without a high school education, so unskilled or semi-skilled workers on, to its own side. But as I argue, it doesn't represent them. But you also had, um, you know, under 30 voters breaking heavily for the Democratic side. And I think some of that, we have to say, was over cultural issues from the left point of view, you know, like abortion and so forth. But um, insofar as those people, uh, those under 30s, and many of them are actually educated, they're part of what you would call a, a, a professional precariat. That is people who um, have a college education, but they haven't been able to find um, stable work that um, would be rewarding for the education they have. Um, or they you know, work at Starbucks or whatever just to make ends meet. These people are, the, you know, if, if they look at what the Republican Party offered them, there was no kind of positive material agenda that would uh, appeal to them. So a lot of a lot of um, Republicans, for example, opposed uh, student loan forgiveness just out of the out of the gate without any kind of offering any alternative or anything. They just said, well, this is bad. It ha 
hurts the working class. The question, of course, is, well, who is the working class? The working class also includes lots of people who went to college and they were promised that if they went to college, they would have um, material security. That didn't work out for them. And so now they're you know, toiling as adjunct professors, uh, Starbucks work, baristas, and so forth. And if they turn to the Republican Party, all the, the message that they get is, well, you're on your own, basically. And that's not a very appealing message. One of your interesting observations in your New York Times op-ed was that the Republicans are mischaracterizing the working class as, you know, uh, labor unions working out on a dock, uh, a lumberjack and so forth. And, and as you mentioned, I mean, it's actually been expanded to this uh, class of, in some places, overeducated people that don't have uh, a career to match their degree. The people that you mentioned, which is the kind of quintessential Republican image of a working class person is a kind of roofing contractor or a kind of burly teamster, electrician, et cetera. Those people are working class. Um, but the Repub you know, a lot of Republican rhetoric about the working class um, does this kind of too clever thing where they narrow the definition of working class to only those people. And then they sort of treat you know, adjunct professors and, and um, anyone who works with sort of information as being basically part of the elite, even if these people are actually living very precarious lives, they have many of the same struggles as people who work with tangible material like, you know, uh, carpentry or um, uh, electrical wiring or what have you. They might work on screens, for example, but they still have the same problem of being working class, which is what it means you you are asset less. And so the only way you have of being able to survive is selling your labor power for wages in the kind of labor market. And so you have the same conditions, but you Republicans frame working class as a kind of cultural identifier rather than, you know, kind of an objective reality. The fact is, you know, the um, American class system is, is, pretty obvious. I mean, you can look, you can go to libertarian economists or you can go to progressive economists. The picture they give you is we have, you know, like the top 0.1% uh, who are the kind of largest owners. You have the top 1.1%. These are Wall Street executives. You have the top, let's say, 5 to 10% of professionals who service the assets of those first two groups. And then you have the bottom 90%. And that includes blue collar workers for sure. But it also means non-managerial workers, non-college edu educated workers, and crucially, uh, what economists describe as downwardly mobile college educated ones. And so it, the party who succeeds uh, politically in this country is one that answers the problems of those 90 percent. I'm not saying Democrats are perfect in this regard. Actually, you know, a lot of my work is critical of Democrats for many things. But the Republican Party um, uh, uh, doesn't it doesn't even begin to answer, try to answer them. Right. So at least you turn to the Democrats. They want to uphold you know, the basic settlement of the New Deal. Uh, they want to uphold, you know, the regulatory state and so forth. Whereas you turn to Republicans, including, I would say, some who pitch themselves as right-wing Republican, quote-unquote, populists, and they still things, say things like, for example, the new par president of the Heritage Foundation, this guy, Kevin Roberts, said uh, not too long ago, quote, government is the obstacle to our flourishing. You know, that's a kind of insane thing to say, right? Because certainly he wants police officers, he wants firefighters, and I would invite him, you know, if we achieve his vision of getting rid of government, you know, okay, you take the first, you know, airplane flight after the Federal Aviation Administration is um, abolished, you you go first, because I'm not doing that, right? So that is hearkening back to actually kind of pre-New Deal mentality still, that, you know, government doesn't have anything good to contribute, you know, uh, it doesn't make sense. And of course, it, you know, if their vision is realized, it's, you know, middle and working class people who the most hurt. So what annoys me is that they frame all this now as kind of like pro working class pro-worker populism. It's not. It's like the same old Republican agenda. And you mentioned uh, there was a Starbucks barista who was complaining about being overworked. Uh, they, they had to work you know, and go to school, and then they had to work all the you know, full time, and then the weekend. And how was that greeted by the right when this worker said, "Hey, I'm being overworked. I'm exhausted. I'm trying my best to work and go to school." And how was how was this greeted? Right. This is a really good example of this phenomenon. Right. So for the past two years, maybe a little bit longer, 
um, conservatives have been complaining about woke capital or woke corporations. And I share that, right? I don't I don't want workers to be politically indoctrinated by their human resources departments or be, be forced to say things they don't believe are true, whatever the perspective of the employer might be. That seems like a violation. So they've been railing against, for example, Starbucks. Starbucks is woke. Look at the products they sell. It's LGBT, this and that. Okay, all right, whatever. Then you actually have a worker coming around and saying, Hey, my life is very hard. They schedule me for 24 hours. It's grinding. And, you know, it is very hard to stand on your feet for eight hours with like one break. And that's the life of a Starbucks barista. And the customers keep coming, right? It's a very brutal grind. And you're making, you know, at best minimum wages or whatever. And, you know, this person com comes around and the reaction from the right is to mockery. Boo hoo, you have to work eight hours a day. Grow up, that's life, you know, sort of. And so it's interesting to me that woke Starbucks is bad, it's terrible, it's ideological, this and that. Then the, up until the moment there's actually kind of workers' rights at stake, and then it becomes they're back to, you know, kind of 19th century freedom of contract mentalities. Well, you chose to work this, you know, it's your choice. You can always walk away, you know, and, and as though people actually have a choice to walk away from a job just because they're tired. You can't. Most, in most cases... The job you have is is paying for various bills. It's all you can't do that. So it's just interesting to me that um, again, the sort of anti woke capital thing is strictly limited to cultural issues, and that it, that won't go far as as I argue we saw uh, Tuesday night. Yeah, I, it, uh, and it seems um, you know although I vehemently disagree with them, it does seem that Trump did have some traction by uh, going a bit to the left, left to center on some of these worker issues during his during his first campaign. Uh, so one has to wonder why aren't more Republicans following that because it was successful? Is that because of who they're beholden to? You mentioned the think tanks and donors. Does that have something to do with it? That's one part of it. You know, look, let, we have to be honest. The Democratic Party also has its kind of plutocratic constituencies, right? Uh, big finance, Hollywood, Silicon Valley. But somehow the Democratic Party manages all these constituencies to an extent to say, hey, OK, fine, you know, we give you this and that. But you also have to make concessions here and there. Unfortunately, from my experience on the right, the donors are just like fully in charge. And so it's it's very hard to break through. Also, I think beyond looking beyond the donors, it's just, um, you know, and the, it's part of the ideology of the Republican Party. Unfortunately, I have to say this is going to shock some people. It's going back to the 19th century. In some ways, for example, even Lincoln had some shortcomings in, when it came to these issues. You know, he's had this famous speech to the Wisconsin Agricultural Society. He was a great emancipator. I'm a huge admirer of Lincoln. But on these political economic questions, he had this picture of the sort of pre-industrial revolution smallholder who's sort of independent, doesn't have a boss. And he just thought that everyone will be a worker at some point, and then you come to own the tools of production yourself. And then you, you know, someone else comes to work for you. And then that person comes to become the owner of his own life. The problem with that is that after industrial revolution, that's not how it works. Most industries are highly concentrated. Not everyone can become a capitalist. Most people have to work for a living. Um, so this has a long pedigree of, of 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 the say intellectually the Republican Party envisions an economy which is a late 18th century economy of like artisans and smallholders and completely independent and tries to impose that on a reality that's just not there. That was all swept away after the rise of the machine and the Industrial Revolution. So it's donors, but also, I mean, that there's some work to be done on part of people like me who are still, you know, conservative writers, intellectuals, to educate on that and sort of move beyond that, which, which may not be successful because of the first half of the problem, which was the donors. Final question. You have an exciting new book coming out next year, and you're going to be discussing the tyranny of the private sector. Can you give us a preview? Yeah, I mean, it's very much along the themes of what we've been talking about. Um, Americans, especially conservative Americans, are very wary of governmental coercion, right? The coercion that government can do to you. Um, we are very alert to that and we're ready to fight that. And that's good in some ways. The problem is that what, what we miss is that uh, we're also subjected to coercion in the private economy, in our lives as workers, as consumers. Um, as online users of online information. Uh, but that's not meted out by like the state. It's meted out by, you know, Silicon Valley billionaires or by uh, your employer. 
And the tech companies are some of the worst. I mean, you, you, there, I remember reading stories about Amazon, for example, employees weeping at their desk um, over some of the things they've had to do. I mean, there, there's a lot of, with the new economy, in some ways, it's like a cyber sweatshop. Correct. Correct. So the book is an attempt to just highlight the fact to show people across different realms of life, the much of the coercion we face is not what comes from the government. It's come, what comes from the employer, the monopolistic uh, manufacturer, that 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 that, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So it, the, the title is actually Tyranny Incorporated, and it'll be out in August, um, August 2022. Three. It sounds very interesting. Any final thoughts you want to add on this topic before we go? Wayne, I'm very uh, grateful to, to, to be on. And uh, hopefully this kind of cross parties and conversations will grow in the coming years. Definitely. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I, I really enjoyed your uh, piece in the Times today. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.